welcome to Socrates in the City, South of France, La Bastide version. Here we are. Yeah. Uh, I am uh, giddy, I think. Um, unfortunately, I'm, I'm to the point of giddiness to be here today with Dr. John Lennox. Um, Dr. Lennox, uh, when I discovered his books and his works, I immediately invited him to speak at Socrates and City. In those days, we would just have a lecture uh, in New York, and Dr. Lennox spoke uh, on actually this book, Seven Days That Divide the World, um, which is dedicated to Larry Taunton, who's sitting over there in a sweatshirt. Uh, but I, I didn't know that this book had been dedicated to, to Larry Taunton, but, it, but it's fitting because Larry has done so much uh, to bring uh, John uh, in, into the wider world in a number of ways. Uh, John debated, Dr. Lennox, I should say, debated uh, Richard Dawkins at a famous debate. You can find it online. Incredible debate. It changed lots of minds and, and, and those kinds of things. Uh, part of why I'm doing Socrates in the City today here with John Lennox is that I want you uh, to be enticed to search out other videos that Dr. Lennox has out there on the web. Dr. Lennox has done a ton of things with Veritas Forums, started by my dear friend Kelly Monroe Kuhlberg. All kinds of stuff out there that you can watch. So if this is your, just your introduction to Dr. John Lennox, I'm thrilled because uh, it will entice you to check out these other videos. The first one you must watch, of course, is The Socrates in the City, in which he discusses this book. If you buy copies of this book, uh, that would be fine with me. Uh, I think you should. But John has written so many wonderful books. Um, uh, his credentials, uh, like many of our speakers at Socrates, Socrates in the City, are formidable. Um, I, I can probably uh, sum it up by reading the back of this book, unless there's more. Uh, it, it's unbelievable. He's professor of mathematics at the University of Oxford, not Mississippi, uh, England. <laughs> not very far from here, uh, fellow in mathematics and the philosophy of science. Uh, he's pastoral advisor at Green Templeton College, Oxford. He's the author of a book, uh, some of you may know, God's Undertaker, Has Science Buried God? Again, that's at the heart of what I want to talk to Dr. Lennox about. He's generously given us uh, uh, the time so we can do two Socrates in the City um, sessions. Uh, he's debated Christopher Hitchens. Uh, forgive me for having gone on and on. Uh, I don't want to steal uh, Dr. Lennox's time. So at this point, would you give a warm Socrates in the country welcome to the man himself, Dr. John Lennox. There we go. All right. Uh, Dr. Lennox, here we are. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, and praise God that you're here. I'm just really grateful to you. Um, as we spoke last night in front of the fire, people don't expect in July in the south of France for it to be cold enough for a fire, but we were sitting by the fire talking about what we would talk about today, and it became clear to me that eight hours wouldn't be enough. So I thought, I'm just going to leave it to you. The issue on the table is this false uh, idea that science and faith are at odds. You, to my mind, are the best person uh, to speak on that subject. And I just thought, if we could speak about that for a little bit, I'd be grateful to you. Well, we can, and thank you very much for inviting me to uh, an event that bears the name of one of my great intellectual heroes. Socrates was an amazing man because he made his impact on culture and philosophy by asking questions. And I sense that your motivation in all of this is to really get people perhaps to go outside their comfort zone and ask the big questions. Yes. And I spent my entire life, even before I'd heard of Socrates, and I heard of him very young, asking questions, being curious about the universe. And this huge question that you've introduced came about in my case because I was fascinated by mathematics from a very young age. And you I grew up in up, Ireland? I grew up in, in Northern Ireland, yes, with parents who made me inquisitive because they allowed me space to think. They were Christian, 
but they were big enough and they loved me enough to let me think and let me explore. And they actually encouraged me to study other worldviews, which was very remarkable. My father handed me a copy when I was 13 of the Communist Manifesto. And I said, what's that? Should I read it? Have you read it, Dad? No, he said, but you ought to, because you need to know what other people think. And that set me on a lifelong process of playing Socrates. I actually do that, but that's in the business school in Oxford. I play Socrates. I use Plato to ask business executives about the big issues in life. But your question, the contrast between, I'm going to say science and God and not science and faith, because faith is involved in science. Now, I know when you introduced me, you were using faith in the sense of religion and belief in God. I regard that as slightly dangerous because it gives people the impression that you've got science here, you've got faith there, yeah. and the two don't meet. Well, faith in English has at least two meanings. One, religion, the Christian faith, the Muslim faith, the Jewish faith, and so on. But it also has a natural meaning, trust, belief, and so on. And I shall be saying if I get the opportunity to and remember in my old age to say so, that science has faith at its heart. So it's not science here and faith over there. And I'm going to be talking about not faith in the sense of religion, but faith in God and science. Now, why that's important to me? There are several reasons, but firstly because I was curious. Christian background but wanted to discover just where my mathematics fitted inside science and then where my science fitted inside the big picture. Let me uh, stop you for a moment. That's a remarkable statement. Most people have very little fascination with math. It's difficult. Um, so the idea that you were fascinated by math and wanted to pursue math uh, is something. But what was it that made you want to fit math into science? I mean, because there, I, I would guess that most mathematicians don't leap into the world of science. You've leapt uh, rather fully into that world and you've not left your math behind. But what was it that pushed you to, to, to be inquisitive about science from the position of a mathematician? Well, I think it involves Christianity in a very profound way because I hadn't been studying mathematics long. Now, I'm talking about being a teenager now, long before I got to Cambridge. I, I'm a teenager and I'm reading and I discover statements like Kepler's statements that God has revealed to us the secrets of the universe, something like that, in the language of mathematics. And I discovered pretty early on through my reading, actually of C.S. Lewis, because C.S. Lewis was a literary genius, but he understood in a way that some scientists don't, the big issues that arose. And he made a statement in one of his books and it really stuck with me. And I've used it all my life and I'm gonna use it now. He looks back at the origin of modern science it arose in the 16th and 17th centuries with people like Galileo, Kepler, and Newton. Let's just stick with those three. And he makes the point that people have observed, and many books have been written about them, that they were all believers in God. And the question comes up, is there a connection between belief in God and doing science? And the answer is, and it still is today, given by most people with nuances, that there's a very profound connection. Lewis put it, as usual, brilliantly. He said, men became scientific. Why? Because they expected law in nature. And they expected law in nature because they believed in a lawgiver. And when I discovered that, I thought, this is wonderful because it's telling me that far from their belief in God hindering their science. It was their belief in God that drove their science. It was the motor that drove it, which is why I find your question, which is right at the heart of our, particularly our Western culture today, it's ironic that today 
people are saying science and God are incompatible when the very people they depended on, the real geniuses of science, all believed in God. And so they didn't see any inconsistency. Now, I learned that pretty young. And what it narrows down to is the very interesting fact that mathematics works. That idea that math makes sense somehow, that the world is under, that, 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 that's, that the world of science is related to mathematical equations. Most lay people uh, would never think about that. And even when I have read about this concept in a newspaper article that some uh, mathematician or some scientist is marveling at the idea that the laws of nature can be understood and that they can be described by math, they, they seem to make it sound stunning, that, it that it's stunning. startling. But to lay people, it's almost as though we don't understand why it's stunning. In other words, we, maybe we associate math and science in such a way that we think, well, of course, it's got to be that that's way. That's right. That's right. But it took a really great mind to see it was stunning. Einstein. Albert Einstein said the only incomprehensible thing about the universe is that it's comprehensible. And he was clever enough to see there was an issue. Eugen Wigner, who also with Einstein won a Nobel Prize for Physics, he wrote a paper which is much loved by mathematicians in 1961. And he called it the unreasonable effectiveness of mathematics. The unreasonable Yes, now that's very interesting. Yes. In other words, you shouldn't expect mathematics to work. Now, Richard Feynman, the great American Nobel Prize winning physicist, said the same thing. It, it's just stunning that it actually works. Here is somebody, and she's a mathematician, and she's thinking in here about the universe out there. And she comes up with equations. And they describe what's out there. I, I mean, how does that possibly work? in such a way that it gives us power over these things. Newton, law of gravity and his laws of motion alone, without even Einstein's corrections, can help us send a person to the moon. How does that actually work? Now, what interested me, and this is a bit later on at university, I read Wigner's paper, I've read it several times. So Wigner wrote the paper as late as 61, you said? Yes, the unreasonable effectiveness. And I said, what do you mean unreasonable? What is the worldview that's driving that verdict? And that opened a whole world to me that wasn't apparent in terms of its significance until the last 10 years or so, when I saw how powerful it is. Because one of the things now that I say to people is my main reason for not being an atheist as a scientist is not that I'm a Christian. It's because I can do science. Because the only thing that makes reasonable the effectiveness of mathematics is my faith in God. That's a very radical statement. It's a very radical and statement. And one almost never hears that statement, even from people speaking on the very subject uh, on which we're speaking. That, that, that you're saying that not only are science and God uh, compatible. You're saying, uh, no, in a way that's wrong. They're, they're not merely compatible. Science drives you to believe in God. That's right. Let me make it even more provocative because I can tell that you're quite a provocative guy and I like it. You see, <laughs> let me put it this way. I feel, I think, and I believe there's evidence for the fact that faith in God and science sit very comfortably, as they did in the minds of Galileo, Kepler, and Newton. What doesn't fit together is science and atheism. I think that atheism undermines science for a reason that is connected with the effectiveness of mathematics. So we should properly be challenging atheists far more than they challenge people of faith. Well, that's right. And I can unpack that a little bit, yeah. if you like, yeah. because it is a major argument these days. You see, we have this trust as scientists, as mathematicians, in human reason. 
We rely on our human reason to get to our conclusions. Now, in the 1940s, C.S. Lewis was writing about this, and I think people didn't really grasp what he was saying. What he was saying is this. He said, any theory of mind that undermines the validity of human reason cannot be true because you reach that theory by reasoning. Okay. okay. Th again, this is another this... heavy one. I want to pause. Yes, it's That's beautiful. A These are big ideas, but they're very, very important ideas. Um, he, he, he phrased it in such a way, Lewis did, at some point, I can't remember the exact quote, but he says, if the universe made no sense, or uh, if the universe were absurd, if the universe made no sense, we should never have discovered that. We never would be able to discover that. That, that is part of it. That goes down to the root of it. And the reason for it, and he put it brilliantly, but it wasn't in the center of the big debate, not to the extent it is today. Because what's happened in the last four or five years yeah. is that a very prominent atheist is beginning to use Lewis's arguments. And that has changed the balance completely. And who is that? It's Thomas Nagel. In New York City. In New York City, NYU. that's right. That's right. But if you like, I'll backtrack a bit so that we can unpack this so that it makes a kind of sense. Yeah. Lewis is suggesting that if you undermine the validity of reason, your theory's wrong. Now, I'm suggesting that that's why Wigner said mathematics is unreasonably effective because his worldview, which was atheistic, followed to its logical conclusion, actually destroys rational thought. Yes. Now, let me put it in the form of a discussion I frequently have. I tease people, my fellow colleagues. They like being teased, you see. And I say to them, tell me what you do science with. And of course, if they're in the physical sciences, they'll tell me about some very expensive piece of equipment. They've got a billion dollars. I said, no, 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 I don't mean that. I mean, oh, they say. You mean my, and they're about to say mind when they remember it's not politically correct to say mind. So they I, say. I had no idea things have gotten to the point where it's no longer politically correct to say mind. Oh, yes, you've got to say brain. The mind is the brain because everything is physical, you oh, see. Okay. We, the, everything let's, can if, be reduced to physics. I was going to say, let, let's, 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 let's make sure that that's clear to the audience. Yes. Because this, this is a, an amazing idea. Uh, the idea that the mind is not the same as the brain. The idea that if we were only moist robots, as somebody disgustingly put it. Yeah, um, computing meat. Computing meat. If that were the case, um, then in effect, uh, anything like a computer ought to develop consciousness. But nothing that we ever know of except humans has consciousness. So the mind is separate from our mere brains. But it has gotten to the point, and I just wanted to annotate that or underscore that, that you're saying that in the world of science at Oxford, people are afraid to use the word mind because it implies that there's something beyond the physical material brain. Well, yes, that's right, but it's not all people. If we step back from this, let's put this in a bigger framework. What we're up against in the culture is the logical conclusion of a materialistic view of the universe. See, let's go back to Socrates and Plato because that will help make things clear. In the world of their time, about 300 BC or so, the Greeks were divided in their view of the big question. What is the nature of ultimate reality? Now, Socrates, Plato, and Aristotle all believed in the gods. They believed there was something more than the physical universe. But Democritus and Leucippus, who were geniuses, because they developed the atomic theory. And the atomic theory is one of the most important things ever discovered. Richard Feynman actually made a very interesting statement. He said, of all of science was lost, all of science was lost, but there was one result that we could preserve to pass to the next generation, just one. 
it would have to be the atomic theory that everything is made of atoms. Now, atomos means indivisible. We know they're divisible, but the basic idea is there is stuff, very tiny stuff, and everything but everything is made of that stuff. But, now how, that how, how, but I have to say, as proud as I am to be a Greek, uh, the idea that someone in Greece in the fourth century, Democritus, came up with that idea how in the world, without going into this too much, but how could they back then have come up with this idea? Well, by a brilliant piece of reasoning. They, they could take a piece of wood and they could cut it and it was smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller. And they reckoned there must be a point at which that process stops by something that couldn't be cut. And this is the basic stuff of reality. But then they made a leap that this would be all of reality. Now that view barrels up through the centuries and it sits in Oxford. It's in fact the dominant philosophy in Western academia. And we call it materialism. Now there's another version which we call naturalism. They're both atheistic. They both deny anything beyond, but some give a little bit more weight to the existence of mind that's independent of matter. Now, if you are a materialist, then you're going to say that when everything else is said, mind reduces to brain. That's all it is. Brain reduces to physics and chemistry, and all we are is physics and chemistry. Now, back to my little story, you see. Let's suppose that's true for a minute. And I say to my friends, tell me what you do science with. I do it with my brain. Tell me about your brain. I have great fun with this. I love it. Tell <laughs> I can, me, I tell me about your brain. Go. What is the brain? Give me the short story. Well, the short story is the brain is the end product of a mindless, unguided process. And I look at them and I smile. And I say this, and you trust it. <laughs> you trust it. Now tell me honestly, and I let this sink in, if you knew that the computer you use in your laboratory or any of the instruments was the end product of a mindless, unguided process, would you trust it? I've never had the answer yes to that, no. And yet, it's now I say, there's a problem there, can you not see? That you are using something that your theories, that is your philosophy, your worldview of what is ultimate reality, is destroying the very thing you want to trust. I regard that as totally inconsistent. Now, from where I sit, atoms aren't ultimate reality. Ultimate reality is God who is mind. You've got it exactly the wrong way round. The fundamental stuff of the universe is not mass energy, it's spirit. God is spirit, he's not material. And therefore, I believe mathematics is very reasonably effective <laughs> because mathematics being a product of the human mind is a reflection of the God in whose image we are made. And that is why science rocketed up in the 16th century because that's exactly what Newton and company believed. Couldn't you take this even another step uh, and say that the, the reason God gave us science or gave us the kind of minds that would want to know and that would eventually discover that science can be the path to discovering everything else was so that in the end we would discover him? In other words, it seems to me that God, and, and this would really upset uh, scientific atheists, but to say that the whole point of science is to discover the God who created the universe. That's why the Lord gave us a planet where we have a, a transparent atmosphere and we can see the stars and we can, uh, we can discover all kinds of things that, that God designed the universe and designed us in such a way that we would by doing science, ultimately discover him. That's right. Let me tell you a little story that illustrates this beautifully, full of irony. 
Larry Taunton, whom you mentioned, and under whose auspices we sit here so delightfully, he organized my big debate with Richard Dawkins. But he organized the second debate with Dawkins in the Natural History Museum in the University of Oxford. In the same place where a famous debate happened that in 1860. Is where th that's right, between Thomas Huxley and uh, Wilberforce, you see, Bishop so, Wilberforce. The, the, the bishop, the son of William Wilberforce. Yes, that's right. It was an amazing situation. Now, when I walked into that debate, I suddenly remembered that there was a deep motive for building the building in which we were having the debate. I checked with the people on the desk, they'd never heard of it. I didn't have Wi-Fi. I couldn't get into it. So in the middle of the debate, I said to Richard, who had worked for years in that building, he had an office in that building, I said to him, I think there's a connection between this building and demonstrating the glory of God through science. Oh no, there's no connection whatsoever, <laughs> you see. Yeah. Now, of course, we checked later and we discovered this is a wonderful thing. That building, which has scientific exhibits, uh, and it is a beautiful building, was built with excess profits from the sale of Bibles by Oxford University Press, and it was dedicated by its founder to the glory of God, so that people could see the magnificence of God in creation. Now, coming more precisely into the point you're making, Eric, I agree with you entirely. I think properly understood, this kind of thing, science, mathematics, is a pathway to appreciating God. Now, you're saying a lot there. Because I think we can, we can narrow that down and make a lot out of it, but just in a moment. Because I'd like to finish the first point about the mind and how it's come into the center of the contemporary debate. One of the most distinguished philosophers in the world is Alvin Plantinga, who was at Notre Dame and is now retired. But he's a brilliant writer and he writes full of wit. But he makes a point roughly like this. He says that Dawkins is right, that our brain and our minds are simply the result of the random permutations of uh, atoms in the universe. Then he has given us every reason to doubt not only his atheism, but his science. In fact, he's given us every reason to doubt any form of rationality at all. So it self-destructs. Now, that's marvelous, but when Thomas Nagel wrote a book with the most explosive subtitle I've ever seen. And then, by the way, this is The Atheist at NYU. This is not only The Atheist at NYU. This is a man who's a hard atheist. He has written, he does not want there to be a God. Not simply he doesn't believe in God. He doesn't want there to be a God. So he's no prejudice. But he wrote this book, and when I came across it first, I... Say that again, that title? Mind and Cosmos, why the neo-Darwinian view of the world is almost certainly false. I thought, what? And then I read it, and he starts by saying, I want to defend. I couldn't believe what I was reading. I want to defend the naive, untutored view that there's something seriously questionable about the idea that everything we see all living things, etc., came about by random, unguided processes. I want to defend that. And very interestingly, in the first couple of pages, he defends Stephen Meyer. I've never seen anyone. You were talking about Stephen, Stephen Meyer. Meyer. For those it? who don't know, Stephen Meyer um, is one of the great, great uh, scientific minds who um, almost invented the idea of intelligent design. He's at the Discovery Institute. Well, he didn't quite invent it. Well, it goes back to scripture, actually. Well, <laughs> <laughs> he, he, has, he has written the modern some idea. impressive stuff. Yeah. And his book, Signature in the Cell, unpacks this all kind of thing. But to see him defended by an atheist, I thought this is amazing. So I've read this book several times, and I've put some of it into some of my books. But at a certain point, he says that 
Here's the problem. If you cannot reduce mind to matter, that's putting it. If you cannot. If you cannot do that, if it's not reducible to matter, then evolutionary naturalism collapses because it's, it's materialistic to the core. In other words, there's something very, very wrong with this materialistic view. Now, I now go further than that. I say, look, we are in the information age. Information is usually carried on material. Information is not material. It's immaterial. Now, here's a this, wonderful thing. This is another huge idea. It is. Information is immaterial. Yes. So if all you believe in is the material universe, information itself doesn't it make sense. It does make sense, yes, absolutely. You'll it does you, make you, sense. But you'll have to explain how information <clears throat> is immaterial. Well, suppose I want to carry a message. I'm sitting on top of a mountain in Washington State my favorite mountain up there with the snow on it. Do you know that mountain? I do. And I'm Rain, sitting on Rainier. the radiator. So I, I make smoke signals. And up they go into the air. And they're seen by some Indians 20 miles away. But they're more intelligent than me. So they've got a telephone. So they pick up the telephone. They convey the information to somebody else who uh, types it on the internet. And it's received in Oxford. The information that's received in Oxford is not material. Material things have been used to get it there, but it itself is not material. And this gives people great difficulty. But is the idea behind that, if my eyes read letters on a wall, I'm reading a sign, yes. the letters on the sign are material. Yes. I am material, yes. but what I gather from the letters the is, concept not, is, not, is material. not reducible on any level to the material. No. Uh, in other words, it's not as if something has been beamed into my brain. Mm -hmm. My eyes can look at the shapes, but turning it into information is somehow immaterial. Let me illustrate this with what actually has happened to me several times. I'm sitting at dinner. And we have lovely dinners at Oxford, you know, in our college. And the seat placings are fixed. And one night, I found myself beside a very eminent biochemist. And unfortunately, he asked me what I did. And I said, I'm a pure mathematician. And he said, how dreadfully boring. And he meant it. <laughs> he meant it. He said that. Yes, he said that. How dreadfully boring. And uh, I saw that this was going to be a bit of a, a social disaster. So I said, but don't worry about that. I know my subject is quite unsociable and complicated. So I tried to make up for that by being interested in the big questions. He said, what big questions? Well, I said, like the status of the universe. Is it created or not? He said, stop. It's far worse than I thought. He said, listen, I'm an atheist. I'm a reductionist, and we have nothing to talk about, and we're going to have a miserable dinner. Well, that was a challenge for an Irishman. <laughs> so I looked at him, and I said, I was a great grin, because I grin, you know, when I'm panicking. I, a great grin, I say to him, no, we're going to have a marvelously interesting evening. He said, why is that? Well, I said, I'm fascinated by reductionism. I know at least three kinds. Which kind are you? <laughs> well, that was a bit difficult. So I helped him out because I'm also quite a kind, friendly Irishman. Yeah, you're very generous. So I said to him, look, you got a problem. I got a problem. You and biochemistry, me and mathematics, we split it up into little problems. Try and solve them. Get insight on the big problem. He said, I do that. I said, I do that. That's methodological reductionism. I said, we both do that. So we have something to talk about. But he said, I'm not that kind of reductionism, a reductionist. I said, I know you're not. You are an ontological reductionist. Ontos, Greek for being. You believe everything can be reduced to physics and chemistry. He said, exactly. And that's why we have nothing to talk about. I said, we have. Why don't we do an experiment? He said, what? I said, you heard me. 
Why don't we do an experiment? <laughs> but he says, this is dinner. I said, yes, but it's Oxford. <laughs> and he said, watch the experiment. I picked up the menu. And he said, what's the problem with the menu? Roast chicken. I said, that's the problem for you, not for me. He said, why? I said, R-O-A-S-T. Those are marks on paper. Yes, they are, but they say roast chicken. I said, how do you know? Well, he said, I've learned English. Oh, I said, that's very interesting. You've learned English, and you give those marks a meaning, and you're a reductionist, everything physics and chemistry. I said, OK, you explain to me how those marks convey the idea of roast chicken and just use the material of the paper and ink. Dead silence. This is a deep, this is maybe not for you, but for most of us, <laughs> this is a very uh, deep, or as we say, heavy idea. Uh, it's at the heart of everything. Yes, but I've never heard, to answer your question. But I've never heard anyone but you uh, talk about this issue. And I was hoping you'd bring, bring it up or we would come to it. But yes. this, this is a fascinating yes. idea. And it, it goes to the heart of all we've been discussing so far about the mind and material. He looked at it. And <laughs> it was very funny, actually. I must say this because his wife was there. And she said, and she said it too loudly, she said, get out of that if you can. <laughs> <laughs> but what was amazing, he did not try. After a minute or so, he said, it cannot be done. He was sharp enough to see that. But it was devastating and, for a man and, of his eminence. He said, John, now he's getting friendly. I have been going to my laboratory for 40 years thinking that could be done. 40 years. So he saw, he saw through it that He saw through it far. like that, like a flash. And I tried to play devil's advocate, which I can be reasonably good at. And I said, but physics and chemistry, properly spoken, have only been going five or 600 years. He said, it doesn't matter. You must have a mind. And he got it, you see. And this is what we're about. That the moment you see language, and this is where I want to blow a hole in the popular conception that all explanation goes from the simple to the complex. It's reductionist. Dawkins wants to explain elephants, as he says, in terms of the bits and pieces that physicists work on. I say that's marvelous where it works, and it does work. We can split water into hydrogen and oxygen and so on, but where it doesn't work, where I want to say it never works, is where language is involved. Now, the interesting thing is this. Here's a man who works on DNA. So I say, look. R-O-A-S-T, R-O-A-S-T is five letters. You saw those five letters and you immediately postulated a mind. Now tell me about DNA, which is 3.5 billion letters, all in the right letters, of course, in a chemical yeah. alphabet, but yeah. they code. We talk about the genetic code and we're not embarrassed about it. So it's semiotic. It indicates it's a sign, semion, a sign. It indicates something that is meaning. What about that? Oh, he said, that's chance and the laws of nature. I said, come on. R-O-A-S-T, mind. 3.5 billion letters in the right order and the longest word we've ever discovered, no mind. There's something odd going on. And I want to maintain that Nagel is right. He's onto something. And it'll be very interesting to see how that thinking develops. One of the most powerful evidences to my mind that there is a an eternal mind behind the universe is first of all that we can do science that we can do it in the language of mathematics that we have language that we can use we can use abstract co concepts that are not material to describe things that are physical all of that points in one direction and one direction only, and it's this. In the beginning was the word, not the particles. 
I, as I listen to you, I think to myself, the, the, the pity is that I assume most people working in science, most atheistic materialists, are never confronted with these questions. They never are forced, as this poor soul was at the dinner in Oxford, to deal with this question. And it's to his great credit that, that he dealt with it honestly. It is. And what you just said resonates with me because of an experience I had not long ago. I was invited to give a prestigious lecture in a very famous American university. And I mentioned this, this very thing in detail. My audience were all scientists. One of them, a Nobel Prize winner. When I'd finished, he came up and in a loud voice he said, why have I never heard this all my life? I said, pardon? He said, these ideas are entirely new. It staggers me that the veil of naturalism and materialism has been so pushed that science and God are opposites, that these ideas are new, and therefore they're preventing discovery. Because, you see, a sensible person would say, listen, we now have to take the mind seriously. We formerly thought it was all just meat. But now we have to take the mind seriously. Surely that begins to make at least plausible the idea that there is a cosmic mind. You see, physicists will now say that information, some of them, not all of them, but an increasing number, is not reducible to physics and chemistry. It's a separate kind of thing. And they put it in a nice little statement like saying, is the universe it before bit or bit before it? You see, this kind of statement. OK, if information is not reducible to particles, physics and chemistry, that means materialism is false as a philosophy. It simply means it's false. And therefore, a science that is purely materialistic is not going to encompass a huge area of reality. That's a very serious business. Now, that could bring us on to another subject because part of the reason that people pitch science against God is because they think that science is the only way to truth. A couple of things that I'm pulling out from what you're saying, it's not as though I haven't thought of them before, but it's really clear as I listen to you that materialism is on the ropes in a way that it has not been for quite some time. There's I been, think so. There's yes. been a, um, a fascist uh, lockstep in the academy no different from the church's uh, attempt to squash Galileo. The irony is that now those in power attempting to squash something, those who are threatened are the scientific materialist establishment. They are deeply threatened and they are trying to squash truth in precisely the way they accuse the church of trying to squash Galileo. But in a it, beautiful historical irony. Yeah, it's an amazing. extraordinary uh, historical irony. Well, I. Um, because, I if I might interject there, the myth is that here was Galileo, the great atheist scientist, making vast progress, and the ignorant church was opposing him. When the reality is, Galileo was a believer when he started and when he finished. And the church weren't the first to criticize him. It was the Italian philosophers. Why? Because they bought into Aristotle's idea that the earth didn't move. Everything moved around the earth. And the church thought that the Bible said the same, so they jumped on the bandwagon. The irony is, here was Galileo who believed the Bible, and he was right, and they were wrong. And it was the whole worldview of the scientific establishment and philosophical establishment with the church hanging onto their, the Catholic church hanging onto their coattails. But what it needs to be seen as, as to what it is, Galileo was actually introducing a more biblical worldview into it. 
And he was right in challenging the domination of Aristotle. Now, the equivalent today is Aristotle has been replaced by materialists. It's not that they believe that the earth doesn't move anymore, but they believe there's nothing but earth in the universe, so to speak. There's nothing but material. And that is being challenged. The irony is then and now that Galileo, the believer in the Bible, was right. It, it, it's, it's all hilarious and ironic. Uh, and sad. And sad. Well, the, the idea, too, that it is uh, Christians, believers today who are calling scientists to be more scientific. Well, in, in that sense, I think what we're trying to say is actually a number of things. It's to, I'm passionate about science, but making science the only avenue to truth is very dangerous and it's logically absurd. If I say science is the only way to truth, well, that's not a statement of science. It's a statement of my own belief. So if it's true, it's false. It self-destructs. It's ridiculous. It's certainly and, not scientific. Yes, so therefore it's false. Because yeah. if science is right. the only way to right. truth, you didn't reach that by science. So therefore, if it's true, it's false. Irony of ironies. I think that's a good place to stop. I don't like to stop. This is so enjoyable. Well, we can carry it on next time. We can carry it on. Ladies and gentlemen at La Bastide, how about a warm round of applause for Professor Dr. John Lennox. Thank you, Dr. Lennox. <laughs>